How can photography, How can provide, photography insights provide insights into different notions of culture, and society? of culture and society? Which issues will be tackled, Which issues will be tackled and by whom? How can exhibitions and publications of various kinds discuss global points of view? What forms of visual translation can be made use of and do these generate what productive resistance? What forms of visual resistance? translation can be made use of and do these generate productive resistance? What are the limits of networked exchange involving multiple voices? This makes me want to brush my toothbrush. This makes me want to predict the past. The symposium, A Question of Perspectives, this year asserts that in artistic production and exhibition making, non-Western perspectives are becoming increasingly prominent. While this is an encouraging development, nevertheless, these perspectives must go beyond a representation of the visible identities and rather expand to transformative equity to address the structural gaps. If we take the art space, for instance, it is very important that migrants, indigenous, queer, trans artists and artists of color get more visibility and access. However, at the institutional level, this must also be reflected in personal structures and decision-making processes. Who sits where and has what functions? In universities or schools, this would mean questioning which knowledge is recognized and taught and which language is taught and delivered, among others. I find art as a tool to think about individual and collective realities. It is a tool to explore which new forms of a resilient historic memory can be conceptualized and discussed, who has a right to be represented and what does radical transformation into a better society actually look like? Who is visible and which stories are being told? As an artist, filmmaker and art educator, I have a personal connection to these questions because the story of migration is part of my history. I have access to specific knowledge and this is what interests me. My works present stories and biographies of lives that have little or no visibility in the official historiography. At school, for example, I learned nothing about the history of guest workers in the Federal Republic. I acquired all of this through interviews and discussions with my families. My name is Abdus Samad Haidari, a refugee from Afghanistan, the author of a poetry book called The Red Ribbon. Land full of ju juicy apricots, sweet fresh pomegranates and clay tested spring water is how I remember my village, Dahmada, Afghanistan. But the image of my sister being murdered with my mother screaming and f falling fainted and my blood running through my brother Abdullah had Abdullah had middle toes after being shot by the Taliban. Life gave us no choice but to run. We are the fifth generation running for our life, pleading for survival. Uh, this one is called uh, Yet You Did Not Come. Uh, I try to write uh, how uh, it feels to be separated from your loved ones. Once again, the cold winter season has arrived. 
carrying with it your fresh fragments, this wrapped in the frozen petals of lilies from behind these tall mountains. And yet, you did not come. Now winter has gone by, the reviving spring is here, the aromatic flowers are back to life, and yet you did not come. The spring has sung its farewell, and the rewarding summer too, the autumn has brought nothing but the old memories of you, and yet you did not come. And now, with this long delay, my eyes have glazed over, my hair has turned white, my vision sees nothing except the dark side of night. Yet, I still keep the windows open, waiting for the clatter of your shoes with begging ears, but nothing do I hear except the cold, swishing sounds of falling yellowish petals rushing over doorsteps like a tidal wave from the sea. Like a tidal wave from the sea. Like a heart sick full, I run towards the door, thinking that you are there, only to encounter the empty, frosty air. Your rich memories are hanging in my mind, however, here I embrace loneliness and my love for you turns blind. This makes me want to call my friend and tell him I can't talk right now. Call you later. This makes me let my food eat me. This makes me fall and hurt the ground. This makes me want to do my desk on my homework. I'm interested in the hidden, diverse perspectives and history, which I find resistant and subversive moments. The moment of sifting through and archiving is very valuable and I find it to have a magical quality, but also has something hidden within it. I find it important, since research plays a significant role in a project, to make precisely this moment of researching accessible and visible as a way of approaching the topic. It's a dynamic process, starting anew, continuing to write, re rewriting. All these forms of actions blur in it. The family materials from archives are then frequently a gateway to collective memory. What is naturally concerned is personal, but I do not want to tell individual stories only. What interests me instead is how it is possible to tell a collective story that is nevertheless personal and intimate. In the collage work, says Alma Rehberi, archival materials are superimposed, pictures are visible and are simultaneously overlaid with other pictures. The same thing applies in the case of telling stories, filmmaking or artistic work as well. I approach a topic, consequently show one perspective and therefore exclude many other. This makes me want to wake my alarm up. This makes me want to let the elevator ride me. This makes me want to read a book from end to beginning.
This makes me want to put milk in my cereal bowl, then the cereal. This makes me want the homework to eat my dog. This makes me want to call in sick to my doctor's appointment. Home rides and backpack. I carry my home in a small backpack. This is my pillow on these rare footpaths. A blanket in these cold, moist sidewalks. Its holes keep me calm. Its hack wraps me warm. In it I snell, in it I brought shots of childhood memories, memories of joy and griefs. My broken pens stand blood, the banned pages of my school books. On it are etched Baba's fingerprints, and Ms. Lars' desperate teardrops, Hakima's gory red ribbon. In it, I carry the bombed soil of hometown, the wistful fragments of my apricot, walnut, and almond trees, the last silent woes of my crumbled walls, the shattered fragments of Ammi's dreams, the aromatic mists of my mad-made home, the lash wetlands of our lives. It reminds me Baba's last helpless look, sister's boiled, rushing tears, brother's final fearful hugs, and me's last worried embrace. With it, I ran across the jungle, climbed to the pacing wire fenced borders, sailed on the back of dark water in starving seas. Its strong rope bridges, I and my village, the Ahmed's unforgettable memories. With it I cried when there was no shoulder to lean. With it I shared my lonesome anguishes when the hermit walls of Cam confined my very existence. In it resides every bit of me every adulthood remembrance, every youthful moment. We both survived life of captivity. It measures lodging the length of brutal times we have spent in detention, the midnight groans, the late evening outburst sighs. It witnesses my miseries, carries their unsaid crimes, Chambers my resilience, holds my young Afghani pride. This backpack honors my dignity, knows me more than the bladed humans I rarely met. But it has been for a while now. My muscles are becoming weaker. I run out of the childish stamina. I run out of the childish stamina, unable to carry it longer. My vision glazes over. My hands lose the crust. I feel like I run out of breath. I'm afraid to sing my last farewell in this cold and unfamiliar land. But when this bruised heart beats the last goodbye, this stubborn eye shut, close forever. Please bury me along. Please bury my backpack alongside me. Or place it under my wandered head in a set of cold bricks. Please bury my backpack alongside me. Or place it under my wandered head in a set of cold bricks so that we turn into ashes together to fertilize your harvesting mango trees as a final gift. This is the only way I can offer my gratitude as a refugee. <coughs>
This makes me want to listen to my therapist's problems. This makes me want to arrest the police. This makes me want to put on a pair of books and read glasses. This makes me want to cut my barber's hair. This makes me want to tell depression to kill itself. And what I show and tell in a film says a lot about what I don't say. And it always also a portrait of the filmmaker. Representing things fragmentarily also contains a moment of rejection, since the idea is subverted to a complete, stringent narrative, since the fragmentary functions as a sketch. Neurobiological memory research has provided new and a quite interesting findings concerning in the construction of memory. The human brain does not function as a storage device or a book, in which we can turn back the pages as we like and then simply reread the story that was lived through remembering. When remembering, we continue to write in the book of life to overwrite what is remembered afresh. From the perspective of neuropsychology, this means that memory is again and again constructed anew. Traumatic experiences can be altered and steered through re-remembering again when we narrate these experiences to other people as witnesses. I find that becoming aware of such memory anew also involves a quite filmic and creative aspect. Making films is first begins in the head. This makes you want to tell my boss he's fired. This makes me want to put numbers in alphabetical order. This makes me want to tell my crush I have a girlfriend. This makes me want to fall asleep before I close my eyes. This makes me want to Google Bing. This makes me want to tell aliens that humans are real. This makes me want to give mosquitoes malaria. This makes me want to drive my parents to school. This makes me want to read a coloring book. This makes me want to let the light turn me on. This makes me want to call my friend and tell him I can't talk right now. I'll call you later. This makes me let my food eat me. This makes me fall and hurt the ground. This makes me want to do my desk on my homework. This makes me want to take a bath with a unicorn. This makes me want to tell the weekend it's Monday.
This makes me want to let my earphones wear my ear. This makes me want to put my toaster in my toast. Art and short stories are the very powerful uh, way of uh, expressing and documenting your feelings, uh, your life experiences. And for me, poetry is the means of survival. I, I can't survive without writing. And for me, poetry is also to document my past, uh, to document uh, uh, what I experienced in the past and also what I am experiencing right now. It is also to express my feelings, to express my emotions uh, uh, in, a, in a way which is more precise. Most of my poems are talking about bloodshed and stuff and traumas and sad things. Uh, and I have also expressed some of my emotions, you know, feeling of love and uh, the time when I, you know, I was in a very epic moments of my life when I was working in Afghanistan, you know, had good salary, good life and, you know, and living in my own country and then suddenly everything fell apart. And I just described every moment. It's not only about uh, sharing one side of the story but also covering all sorts of stories.